Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show, episode number 297. That's episode number 297 with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. How's it going? How are you feeling? Good, great. How am I? Hmm, so so, you know, so so. Still hanging on in there for dear life, as I'm sure the rest of the world is. Um, doing a good job of trying to my best, which is really difficult to do because, you know, the information's so readily available, but I'm trying my best to stay away from all sort of news sources or news outlets for the best part of maybe the first six or seven hours of my day. And then towards the end, when I want to have a bit of a catch up or I want to um, get my dose of misery porn, then I'd log in and check out what's happening around the world and hope that, you know, nothing crazy has happened in the UK. But so far, um, it's looking quite bleak. In some places, the numbers are flattening out a little bit. Um, other places like Germany have kind of defied expectations and somehow they've been able to kind of steady the flow or no, they've kind of been able to stem the tide of uh, fatalities because they're testing really early and the places that haven't tested early are struggling, you know, the usual ups and downs of society. But enough of that sort of stuff. I'm sure you probably got enough of it during your week. So we're going to spend most of the time talking about things that happened during a week in the Internet as per usual. If it's your first time checking out the show, then of course, um, leave me a comment below, smash that like button or hit subscribe, actually leave a comment below and let me know what you think about the show. And if you're listening via the audio podcast, of course, five star review go a long way to help the show get spread and share it with all your family and friends. Um, before we get into all the good topics I've got during the day, I went to quickly plug a couple mixes I did over the weekend. I've been trying to make my weekends, uh, uh, sort of like a DJ practice hours, right? I kind of download a few songs over the week, arrange them into a playlist and think really deeply about how they flow, about things that work well in a sequence and just try and challenge myself a little bit to kind of put myself outside my comfort zone. Um, of course, you know, playing music um, for yourself indoors is a bit weird, but I'm lucky that in some respects, it's a hobby that you can do on your own. You know, you can be quite um, content buying some records from Fonica, coming back home, opening a beer and just mixing until, you know, your eyes run dry, right? It's pretty easy to do, but I guess if you're like a stand-up comedian or an actor of sorts, it's probably a bit difficult to maintain your practice or to practice your craft in any way, shape or form because you need an audience, right? You need someone to be there in order to kind of get a response, sort of like a call and response show. But with DJing, you can sort of, you know, if you've ever seen someone like, Ben UFO or Surgeon Play, you know that there are people out there who just kind of have their head down and just play and never look up. So you can go in and sort of like, you can go to a club and kind of be on your own, in your own sort of world. So you can extend that when you're at home as well. So um, it's been a bit strange, but you know, I like doing it. I think it's good practice. Um, It keeps the mind sharp. I don't want to get to a point where, you know, God forbid, somehow this thing turns around and things are okay and then you know i get a flurry of emails from places wanting me to play somewhere and i haven't touched a deck in like a month or two months or three months you know there's nothing worse than trying to play music or mix just even just mix and blend not even do anything crazy no crazy transitions or tricks you feel so rusty so i'm trying to keep myself fresh trying to keep myself motivated no but trying to keep myself um what's the word called taking over creatively so i make sure i don't make any mistakes when i get back on the wagon so I uploaded two mixers over the weekend. I'm going to put them here on the screen. Number test mix number 40. Um, and then, of course, uh, test mix number 41 over the weekend. Um, they're both about an hour. One's an hour 20, one's about an hour 50. I'll link it below in the show notes so you guys check it out. Um, you know, nice kind of chill vibes, nothing too crazy. Um, and again, I put the full track list in there as well, which I'm trying to be a bit more on top of because, you know, tracklisting and stuff i think i've had a little bit of a love hate relationship with tracklist i think in one regard you can get a little bit um not you can get a little bit closed off you don't want people to steal your tracks which is you know one thing but you know i'm, I'm a nobody in the grand scheme of things so if you want to steal <coughs> the stuff i played in fair do but also a part of me is also like you know i think part of the part of what makes someone good or bad in my eyes especially um it's personal preference is usually song selection i think if you're smart enough or if you have a if you had to have head screwed on we can all kind of go on the beat port chart and pick you know 100 of the best songs out on the given genre you're interested in and just mix them together it's not hard to do but part of what really separates the you know all right djs from the really really good ones is the ability to kind of 
select a wide variety of music and somehow make it fit together in a really coherent way and again it's something that you only build up over practice something that you build up over time uh, you know hours put in slogging out playing for a crowd that wants you there playing for a crowd that don't want you there you get to kind of hone your sound really go, um, see what works best for you um, and then that's where you build your kind of taste levels where you can essentially because I would deem taste level like you know imagine you, you bought an EP or an album from a big artist or, or you know collective and then you found a track that you like that fit your set that wasn't a lead single that would be like the taste level because the easy choice to do would be to pick the lead single or the singles from the album but the harder choice would be to pick like the b-side right and then make that work make that pop off um which is part of, you know it's, part, it's ingrained in the underground um scene in general but you know it's something that's been lost in, in nowadays because of the advent of digital streaming it's easy to get hold of some of the biggest tracks or the ones that work really well and sometimes you know you might play in a place where they only permit you to play for an hour so there's no real time to really dig in and get geeky but um i try to you know mix it up a bit give a bit of variety so if you want to hear what i kind of play and what it sounds like definitely check those out again as i mentioned it's all one word handsome black man soundcloud.com for such handsome black man all mixes on there but i'll link it in the show notes for you guys below to check out um if you are that way inclined so um moving on in um topics what i got for you got loads of culture stuff bit of streetwear news i want to catch up on that i thought would be an interesting again try and keep it as corona free as i can and then you know go from there um as per usual if you want to follow me on the socials i'm posting quite a bit on there check me out on twitter as well um twitter.com for slash agostino single one word i'll link in the show notes below and of course on instagram too instagram.com for slash agostino zinger or one word so let's get into the show and get into some topics that i thought of interest for to share right here um babidi babidi ba. so talking about actually we, we, before we jump into some topics let's talk about uh sets i saw over the weekend right because i think this might be of, of interest because there was a really good article that i spoke about on mix mag actually about the live streaming of dj sets um i've been doing a little bit of that i've been doing i did a couple stuff on youtube a couple of things on instagram but you know didn't really work too well um you kind of get loads of uh what are they called copyright rec- or takedown requests right copyright or takedown trademark requests from um, record labels coming in and jacking your shit and then on youtube sometimes your stuff gets copyrighted as well which is probably why people go on twitch right because there's less tracks of you get taken down because i think the mix i upload on youtube i think might have been i don't know of the 10 tracks maybe two, six or seven got muted but i had to mute them because you know they were they got copyright struck so that wasn't good but i thought i linked to a show that i watched over the weekend that i thought was really good because i'm again i'm a bit on the fence with the whole um online uh video streaming thing of dj sets i think primarily because most of the time if i am watching a boiler room you're watching it specifically half well not half i'd say 70 80 percent of the reason why you're watching a boiler room is what somebody that you like right an artist a collective a club night whatever it may be someone that you've got an affinity towards and then the other 20 percent or 30 percent will be to see who else is in the room catch a vibe feel like you're there it might be a bit a good a good bit of a warm-up before you go on your night out as well um and just in general and it's good just to kind of people people doing in the background it's just fun kind of people watching so when you take out the people you take out the clubbing environment and you just have somebody standing in a room playing music i guess because i do it myself it can get a bit boring it can get a bit stale um it can be a bit flat so sometimes I've seen it work really well when it's a vinyl DJ, right? Because you know the Dax J set recently on Boy Room was really good for that. I'll play that actually next. But the first one I thought was really good was over the weekend was um, Dixon did a uh, a little Boy Room set that he played for them. And it's funny because Dixon in an interview recently with um, Electronic Beats, I think a few months ago, a couple of months ago maybe, he did mention kind of like in a backhanded compliment way that he wasn't really that infused or that you know crazy about the way that they uh live stream their dj sets on boiler room they thought it was a little bit you know a little bit basic a little bit samey samey and um you hear a lot of people say that right when it comes to cdjs i think mostly or you know the ad when people move to vinyl cdjs i think dbs once said it about that he felt that sometimes the problem with cdjs is that it didn't it didn't help people become more creative it just made them more lazy because obviously there's a sync button you got the waveforms um you know 
whatever there's loads of things that are in your kind of favor you know don't really have to you don't even have to loop it on beat you just hit one button and it loops it uh via the beats that you want so he felt as if like it made people a little bit too safe they didn't take any risks so whereas when you're playing with vinyl you had to because it's so mechanical and you had to require so much of your motor functions you couldn't help but be attached to the music you couldn't just coast by looking at the waveforms waiting for it to blip and then drop another track in or waiting for it to kind of level out and then make something else and you have to be really attentive to what was going on so it required a lot of you i think he mentioned something like he always felt a lot more tired a lot more fatigued after a vinyl set than he did do with cdj so that's why he mentioned that when he does play on cdj's devious one i'm saying he would always request having free turntables or free cdj's because it allowed him to be more creative with sets right to layer on a you know to layer on some bass on top of a hi-hat maybe loop this other deck it required a lot more it kind of pushed him more as a dj and i think that's what kind of dixon was kind of getting at with the live stream on boiler room it's a little bit you know it's just a sticking a camera on a tripod and just recording somebody playing in a club it might be too dumb or whatever blah blah, blah. but to be fair to boiler room they have they have kind of improved their their way of doing things i think some of the places that they put the first the kind of put the raves in the spaces are really interesting it's not as obviously awe inspiring as a circle you know that youtube channel but it is pretty good and they always have somebody now um with a rig kind of going in a crowd and filming people who want to be filmed it can be a bit difficult you know if you go to berlin or something people aren't necessarily that up for having cameras stuck in their faces so it can depend on where you are but i think they're making some concerted efforts to move and to kind of evolve that way of presenting the dj sets but obviously dixon had to kind of you know do it his own way and really kind of uh lay the marker down and he employed this weird sort of like um what do you call it augmented reality sort of thing virtual reality sort of vibe where essentially the entire i think it was um at the store i forgot what the store is called in berlin is it mute the noise i forgot the name of the record store that Intervision have but essentially kind of uh blacked out the entire store as apart from maybe the wall with all the debt or the vinyl and the entire surroundings around him changed into these different landscapes which i'll definitely show you now on screen because it's better to just show you than to describe it with my shitty descriptions here it is so if you listen to the podcast app um he's essentially playing on the you know playing his set he's got his uh rotary mixer and his cdjs and to the right of him is sort of like the wall with all the vinyls and shit and essentially everything else has been blacked out which i think kind of helps with the augmented reality and then if we kind of let me just see if i can skip forward and if we skip forward a little bit just lower the sound on here as well a little bit boop, 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 boop. so if we skip if we go a bit back over here you'll see that I should, I should, I should. yeah around here which is quite quick cool. so dark and dark a little bit it changes incredibly immersive like you get the whole 360 turning of the camera he gets all pixelated it gets all weird. it goes into little bits of pixels as well kind of skip forward a little bit more and then you get this amazing like underwater kind of to make things even better this was um in part due to them promoting the transmoderna ep that i've just listened to actually say on my run which is this this represents transmoderna which basically features a lot of the tracks he's been playing during his transmoderna um residency in ibiza and i think after the actual performance all of those tracks were available to purchase on bank camp and on the music the money will go directly to the artist you know to support them during this sort of tough time so that was a really cool little tie in so again i think presentation wise it's a lot more you know there's a lot more to it than the stuff that you might have seen you know in other places or the standard sort of like you know black table with a cloth over it that makes it more interesting but also for going forward it could be a good way it could be a good way of sort of like presenting 
it could be a good way of sort of like um how do you say it could be a good way of maybe presenting the idea of somehow putting together a festival imagine imagine you put together a festival um like a coachella <coughs> for instance right but you want to justify um charging viewers to watch a show at home live stream it because you know i'm assuming to set up a live streaming uh, platform for a festival isn't the easiest thing to do right um that's why a lot of the bands that record, or a lot of the acts or artists these days that record shows, they don't necessarily have people come in recording the live show that you would do previously, right? Loads of heavy metal bands or rock bands in the past would always have a live album they kind of put out. So fans could have an idea of what they sounded like live and then you'd hear that, you'd be like, oh my God, sick, I want to see, I want to see them perform next time they're in my town. They don't do that now. So they, they usually, you, you rely on people sharing videos of you on Instagram or on youtube or any other social media platform right that's what you usually rely on you don't really care about you know having somebody come in and plug into the soundboard and have your thing recorded crisply because it costs a lot of money but imagine if somehow they were able to your innovation was able to somehow um take that setup um plug it into a club where you're playing at and then live stream it on a dedicated platform they kind of built from the ground up or maybe it's a specific link to a disc a specific link to a private twitch channel something along the lines that you could do right or even just what well, did they do that with the um, did something similar with the what's his face uh with the logan paul and ksi boxing match where they had where you could basically buy it as a pay-per-view so that would be quite cool i think because i think if you're gonna pay for a pay-per-view of something that you're already kind of are conditioned to have for free from boiler room you have to maybe raise the stakes a little bit and provide a really unique experience. Maybe they send you a pair of, you know, VR 3D glasses in a post beforehand, or maybe they give away a few beforehand so you can just get a feel of it and kind of really um, elevate the level, the kind of online clubbing experience. I don't know. Maybe that might be a good way. Again, it might require a lot more effort. It might require more money. It might be a logistical nightmare. I don't know, but I could see it going that way. So that was one of my favorites. That was one of my favorites of the weekend. And then the last one was um, Dax J played again. So, so obviously, you, if you have a backdrop, it obviously helps. And then the other way it helps too, if you're going to live stream on, online, is that if your person live streaming is playing on vinyl, because vinyl intrinsically requires all your senses all your you know motor neuron functions your complete attention you can't just coast by be on your phone and fuck around right you've got to be attentive to what's going on um, and Dax J is a really good example of that he absolutely smashed it <laughs> in the show notes you guys to see but it's uh that's actually live from isolation they're doing a few of these actually i think they're just kind of reaching out to some of their family and friends and getting them to put together a little mix and so far i think the selections have been pretty cool um i think they did one with all the big clubs in berlin and had them do different sort of like off-site little events i think ellen Alien did a really good one with um uh what was it um with grace muller a nice good set there and obviously the whore how you pronounce it Hore. um YouTube channel has a few on there too so there's a few selections again it's hard to kind of get into them because of course the first thing you do when you listen to those kind of things that you miss going out but i think in terms of kind of keeping that um sense of a uh, weekend spirit or weekend energy alive i think it's a good idea to kind of leave those things for the weekend leave it for friday slap it on in the background while you're doing the hoover or whatever it may be and enjoy and skank around so anyway, let's move on to another topic here. Da, 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 da. Oh, this was quite um funny. Um, this story broke, I think, over the weekend, or I think maybe a couple of weeks ago. 
about this influencer called Arlene Sharas or something. Let me see if I can get her name right here. There's a whole thread about it here on the old Twitter that I think was of interest that kind of summed it up really well. But essentially, um, one of the you know one of the, a well-known Instagram fashion blogger, which is weird, isn't it? Because you know Instagram is nothing like a blog whatsoever. But they kind of have the kind of quote-unquote blogger underneath their title. But basically, everyone that was essentially your quintessential, you know, fashion blogger, they had the little blog spot, migrated over to Instagram, and now they built a following. This girl, she's famous for the label called Something Navy, and, you know, standard sort of like Caucasian female, really skinny, wears loads of beige clothing and stacked trousers, track trainers, has a nondescript hedge fund looking husband, and a couple, two, couple, two um, cute kids. Standard affair, right? No. So this person got into a bit of hot and bother because they decided to flaunt the fact that they were being tested for COVID-19 to the millions of followers in order to kind of bring them along on the journey and end up biting them in the ass. Um, And it's been a pretty epic uh, spiral of events since then. Again, um, I'm not one for cancelling of people, but it's just funny to see the amount of people this whole COVID-19 has kind of, uh, the amount of victims has claimed outside of the fatalities, just the the social faux pas have been, or the social media faux pas have been really staggering. Um, It it should be pretty easy to navigate if you're somebody of notoriety, right? You should be able to understand that, you know, people are going through tough times, people are losing their jobs, people have lost their jobs, people are losing family members, and just, you know, they're in a rough space. So the last thing they want is for you to, gallivanting around in your Hermes bag with your perfect family, you know, throwing, you know, kind of rubbing in their faces. So it should be easy to navigate. You just keep your head down, you know, stay at home, do your thing, upload a couple outfit pictures, you hang out with the kids making pancakes, I don't know, keep it nice and chill and you should be okay. But the moment you start, I don't know, declaring that you have a virus and then suddenly two days later you get tested and then suddenly later you're, you've been rapidly recovered, I don't think it's a good way to go about things. So this is a thread. This is from a lady on here on social media called Sophie Ross, who kind of collated it and made it a little bit more easy to kind of get through. But this is how it starts off, right? Um, so it says here, um, Ariel Sharness and her di- and her dangerous and bizarre behavior surrounding her COVID-19 diagnosis, a threat. So it says here, let's start from the beginning. Two weeks ago, Ariel posted about feeling sick. Uh, full disclosure, anyone who follows uh, her knows that she's a hypochondriac. So, of course, all of us immediately knew there was uh, where this was going, which is interesting, isn't it? Everyone that's a notable figure online, especially people, the ones that people follow a lot religiously, they've always got something going on, isn't it? There's always something, whether it's bipolar, whether it's ADHD, whether it's, you know, self-diagnosed depression. There's always something about them that they have to kind of broadcast to the internet. I don't think there's many high-profile social figures, quote-unquote, who don't, who haven't declared their one kind of physical or mental ailment they have to let it be known which is interesting in itself is that a way to kind of garner sympathy is it a way to kind of seem quasi relatable <coughs> i don't know but it's just interesting that that that's a thing in it um so it continues here right away she called up a doctor friend quote unquote which is interesting in that regard right um to get a flu uh covid test in her car literally the nurse came outside so ariel could wouldn't be able to walk in um ariel filmed it all on ig while plugging the docs on his office then she went silent for an extra drama waiting the results which you know standard kind of foe when you're that kind of level of an influence so you know how to kind of game the system you know you upload the story really early in the day then you maybe upload another picture then you go quiet for five hours people reply to your com- people reply in the comments oh i hope you're all right i think it's like okay and you just you maybe like a couple then you go quiet so people can see that you did something you liked it but then you just kind of stir up the controversy anyway it continues stir up the tension sorry suspense actually that's the word i'm looking for so um the next week here says and rightfully she was dragged for this yeah um Aaron was accused of using her coronavirus connections to get covid tests and to cut the line even though her symptoms were mild and she's not high risk there was a major backlash for this across page six diet prada and daily mail so here's a of course here's a headline from new york post as influencer uses personal connections to get the test early and then another one says here, Instagram influencer with 1.3 million followers reveals she has a coronavirus after live streaming the test she get from a doctor um, friend despite normal Americans being turned away. That's interesting. The Daily Mail headlines have like this massive paragraph in it. I've never really noticed that before. Usually people have like one line, but they have a massive paragraph, like essentially um, in like type, I don't know, is that size 14 font? 
It's mad, isn't it? And then the last one here it's from Diet Prada, of course, going in the hearse is a headline here for Los Angeles Times saying that uh, this where are they from they're from the philippines he gave his wife cpr as she died after contracting the virus officials won't test him and then the following slide which is you know a little bit sad uh, of all the this huge influencers getting tested for coronavirus and bringing her 1.3 million followers along with the ride so of course the issue here is that i think what we've seen especially with this whole covid19 thing is that it's laid bare the inequalities in the world right it's kind of exposed people to the uh, you know the, you know hear people say oh the market is a market and it's self-corrective right it selects for people that work hard but sometimes <clears throat> there's people out there in the world who are just you know rightfully or wrongly you know they have a level of privilege or level of access that other people just can't money and sometimes fame can't really buy it's usually you know deep rooted connections maybe family ties um maybe you know favors owed by people way above your station who kind of allow you to essentially um your life expectancy is kind of extended for the fact that you have these connections you are able to kind of tap into um you know different health different health um initiatives or different new things are happening new developments in the world you're able to kind of plug into them sooner than anyone else because you you'd, you'd you'd imagine if a vir- if a vaccine was found they would probably be made available first you know to world leaders i'm assuming people of notoriety and then it'd go down to all these people that have connections so flaunting that out is not really the best thing to do you'd probably want to if you were going to game this if you're going to kind of use it to game the system as will bring your followers along with the ride the best thing to do would probably be to kind of reach out to a private clinic go and just pay the money right document the entire journey of like calling up a private clinic declaring and saying you know letting the audience know hey i know i'm really thank i know i'm really fortunate and i have this big position but i'm using my platform to show everybody what actually goes into getting a test done because i know some people there's been some misconceptions out there but i want to let it bear you ring up you mute your you mute when you say your details you know the little kind of you know the standard sort of like um come on my journey sort of thing but this just looked a little bit fishy from the onset and it just kind of was done in obviously a little bit of a snobby way i would say in my opinion then it continues here this is also Aero's husband brandon posted a volvo sponsored story on the way to the doctors unbox and posted his new louis vuitton purse as she was waiting for the covid19 results let that sink in can't find the screenshots but here's proof that that part of comment section then it continues here she then posted this on the third on the 17th of march saying she will be resuming her content as normal if it did if it offends anyone or if you're being insensitive i'm sorry but i'm doing it and said she would not address the covid 90 situation again which again is a typical sort of like um bait and switch move that a lot of influencers do where they will do something controversial for the sake of being controversial get a lot of comments and a lot of negative feedback and then when they ask to kind of, and then when they called up on it um, and they've asked to explain themselves they'll then revert back to saying look i'm not you guys are taking blood on a porsche i'm not going to talk about it ever again but they'll leave the post up so you're kind of you know it's a way to game the system and for some for some to be completely honest I, just, I do think there is a little bit of you know if you're a viewer or if you're a fan of this person and you get riled up you only have yourself to blame like you know exactly what they're doing you're both playing a call and response or a game if you don't like what they're doing you just always do is quote the gun foil give them a little block or mute their story and that's it it's over with so i don't really get you know i'm not really that pissed off about that sort of stuff and it continues here this is on the 18th of the third Errol announced that she was tested positive for covid she got her results back extremely quickly it usually takes five days source my covid positive friend who is actually miserable because of the virus right now so she got it back i think there's some screenshots of her saying that she got the results right I want to give you an update, blah, blah, I'm not reading that entire thing, and it continues here. There wasn't any further fanfare about COVID. Query went back to normal person as per usual. Uh, duh. And then she said, husband, this, what is the, where's the really good stuff? Here it goes. She's wearing the rumors of the video. She would never lie about having it. So I guess the rumors, the, the reason why people got, anyway, let's just sum this up. So I think what store people went crazy was that she went, as soon as she got the results for it, she went, she decided to go to a Hamptons apartment. Or Hampton's home, not apartment, with her family to kind of get away from the city. And this was obviously um, after or just before um, Governor Cuomo sort of told everyone to kind of stay at home and they wouldn't be able to kind of leave and everyone wants to go on lockdown to make sure, you know, they were kind of stemming the tide of the virus. So that privilege kind of smacks in the face of everybody else. People kind of got annoyed by it and there wasn't a real way to kind of for her to explain um, 
why that was a good thing or to kind of explain it in a way that people would understand so i guess in conclusion i'll just say it's just strange how a lot of these but i guess it might maybe it's a different thing maybe it's because you know she probably comes from affluent background and she doesn't really necessarily had to uh navigate or talk with real regular people but it's just it's just weird that they're so dis detached from reality i suspect that's the thing because it what would what people are kind of requesting isn't necessarily you to like you know no one's gonna no one's suddenly not going to remember that she's you know a millionaire or that she comes from a wealthy background we know that we know she has money but i think if you're going through a hard time especially if you're there and you're a fan of hers or you have a fan member that's sick the last thing you want to see is just her kind of throwing it in your face and um just being naive about everything else happening in the world you want a little bit more humility if that's possible so i guess the only bit of advice i would say is that if you're somebody of notoriety and you have a big following just shut up really in it just don't say that much post a couple of stories encourage people to stay in a bit more maybe share videos of your family but kind of keep it a bit bland a little bit you know a little bit vanilla so that you don't get your fans turning on you because that's i think that's the problem with these sort of issues is that people like me aren't gonna necessarily follow this girl and could give a shit but I guess her actual fans, people that actually care about her content, will look at you sideways. And I've always thought that some of these influencers, for the most part, because it's still beggars belief in my regard in some of them, especially some of the basic, you know, looking skinny white girl versions of them. It's really strange how they have a really big following because usually, you know, not not regarding her, but more likely than not, they have an easy eating disorder. More likely than not, they have, you know, um, the bank of mum and dad behind them to support them. Um, they have all these different advantages that not a regular person has. So it's not as if they're like a cool micro influencer that you know um, is kind of going through the same struggles that you are. It's just somebody that's well detached from you as a Kylie Jenner would be which I never got why people would kind of look up to people like that because there's nothing you can really relate to in that regard. But, you know, maybe it's aspirational. But I always thought that if you're going to be that kind of influencer that kind of touts going to Chanel and going to Prada every week, you have to make sure you do right by your fans because when you lose your core, everyone else is, no one else is going to come and kind of fill those numbers up. So you can't necessarily take advantage of it. But then saying that, you know, how many YouTubers have you seen online who do you know the most nuttiest of things and their fans keep coming back and back and back and back maybe there's a kind of weird sort of like stockholm syndrome when it comes to people that you follow for the first time you just can't let them go i don't know but i would kind of heed caution on that one but you can check out that story if you're interested and then there's another one i want to check out here the 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 diet prada <laughs> Oh, there's a story here about Olympic athletes also struggling during this epidemic, which I thought was of interest. Let's quickly read this story. This is on ESPN. I'm assuming because, you know, the the Olympics has been postponed, I think, until next year. I think they actually uh, stipulated finally the IOC finally got back to the athletes and confirmed that they were going to postpone until next year. Um, there was a little bit of hoopla around what date was going to be. I'm sure loads of sponsors were involved getting it here, trying to make sure it kind of goes through. But finally... Um, a little bit of common sense prevailed and they're going to uh, just postpone it not cancel it outright and it should be okay but I'm assuming if you're an athlete and you've been training for the best part of what four years for this to come around for it to be cancelled must be a bit of a bummer but it's an article from ESPN it's titled um, Complete, um, Complicated Path Back to Normalcy, Normalcy uh, for 11,000 Olympic hopefuls so here it goes it says um, close your eyes and you can picture it quite easily even amid the chaos of this unimaginable time Dark under a dark midsummer night, sixty-eight thousand people from all corners of the globe standing in unison Japan's National Stadium. Eleven thousand elite athletes marching on the track below, collared behind their national flag, smiling and waving to a worldwide television audience. And at the centre of it all, standing beneath an Olympic flame, International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach. Da, 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 so cool. Anyway, so this of course is the Olympic dream, the belief that the wake of Tuesday's news, the Summer Olympics will be postponed a year, their return will reunite the world after of COVID, which is very true i think we saw that a lot when the Olymp london olympics i think there's a lot of there's a lot of doom and gloom around it the funding um the amount being spent on it the fact that it was going to uh, gentrify an area in london that hasn't necessarily been touched yet there was a lot of negativity around london olympics and once that opening ceremony happened everyone saw it was blown away and it kind of um that sort of good feeling, that sort of good sentiment did carry through for a good six months after after the Olympics were finished. So it wouldn't surprise me if they do postpone it to next year. 
especially with everything that's going on especially with you know they do a good job of really highlighting the stories of some of the athletes especially from lesser known nations um sort of giving the platform to tell their story especially you know god forbid but let's say they lean into somebody who lost a family member due to the due to covid19 it could really um mark a uh it could really be a good way to sort of not fight back but to sort of represent the collective um you know experience that everyone suffered from around the world and sort of bring people together in a big whole two plus celebration so it definitely wouldn't surprise me if that was the case it continues here uh but the path uh from here to there is compl- it's a complicated one but for the olympics a year is a far more difficult task than pausing the nba season or rescheduling the 2020 soccer championships it's figuring out equitable solutions for 11,000 athletes from 206 different countries. It's recognizing 200,000 volunteers. It's assuring the safety, enjoyment, and entertainment of 4.5 million ticket holders. Few would uh, argue, choose the city there, but um, ensure there are far more greater global concerns right now than the ability to Olympic athletes to compete. But in Olympic circles, as much as uh, Tudor's news brought clarif- uh, clarity for athletes wrestling with whether to train or to stay at home. It also brought an encyclopedia worth of questions, the majority of which, at least for now, come with the answer TBD to be determined. So it says that for me, um, it almost feels like a wasted year, like it didn't even happen, which is very true. I think that's why I'm really annoyed by the whole Dana White UFC thing. Um, they're still trying to go forward. They're still trying to work out a plan for UFC 249, which was meant to be headlined with Khabib and Tony Ferguson, the fight everyone wanted to see. Now, because that fight isn't happening, Dana now is trying to substitute um, Khabib because he can't leave Russia with somebody else. But, you know, we wanted to see the Khabib be Tony fight. If that can't happen, just pause the fight or postpone it for another day. But he doesn't want to. So I'd assume, um, in the same way the fighters are on edge, right? Khabib had a whole training camp to prepare for this fight, was on course to show up and prepare. And, um, was was of course to kind of show up to the fight, no injuries that we kind of are aware of, um, to kind of put his body and his mind through that grueling um, affair for it to be cancelled for reasons outside of his own control, is uh, you know is painful, but also to have this you know present that's kind of uh, doing his best to go against any kind of medical advice and still pursuing putting on the fight, so you're in this constant loop you're caught in limbo basically right you're kind of like in a fight and purgatory you're not close you know you're not close to being counseled you're close to being oh you're stuck in the middle what are you doing are you still cutting weight are you still trying to run five miles a day like it's just a ridiculous state of affairs so this guy really pointed it out um to this guy two-time world wrestling champion uh jordan burrows he said uh, there's just so much up in the air now showed um shot to the back burner um, six time six oh, sorry 76 americans uh, already qualified for tokyo 2020 before choosing announcement during a conference last week with u.s olympic athletes burroughs said an athlete asked if those qualifications would hold for 2020 2020 2021 very really true very good question while the united states olympic committee and paralympic committee leaders said they'd likely would the decision is far from uh, final which is ridiculous really i mean they should just carry it over and said then imagine being an olympian a whole year in advance said Burroughs. Why the what does that do to your willpower and your fire and willingness to train? And for everyone else, what are, what are, when are trials? How do you qualify? Uh, there are so many uncertainties, uh, but it's not anyone's fault, which is very true. And I think I've I felt that in a little regard. I think I remember that was part of the reason why I decided to book races ahead of time because I found that when I was just running just after work or before work on the way home, there will be a point in time where I'll just hit a bit of a wall and I won't necessarily know how to kind of get over it. And I will try to, and the, and the recurring kind of question in my head will be like, what's the point? What are you doing? It's why, 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 why? Um, and it can be hard then the next day to get up and have the motivation to go and train because you're not necessarily training for anything. You're just going to train for the sake of it, which probably was the reason why a lot of the, thinking of it now, speaking of lines, probably why a lot of people are into doing martial arts or those kind of things because there is a level of progression. There is a clear way to kind of get better. It's kind of demonstrable. You know you're getting better the more you're going. Um, that could also be why people do those kind of things. But, you know, if you don't have a race booked in, you have something in the schedule, it can be difficult to keep the motivation. So imagine if you're an Olympic athlete and suddenly they take away the ability for you to compete this year and then they have all these questions left in the air for next year, you can't really justify in your head, you know, logically or rationally that you shouldn't have that, that donut or that you shouldn't stay out tonight or that you shouldn't drink. It's not going to happen, is it? Because you know, there's only so much willpower. Willpower is fine, they say, right? You need to have. There needs to be more that's driving your way of doing things than willpower. You can't rely on it because you know you can have a bad day and suddenly willpower's gone out the window. 
I thought that was quite interesting, you know, the fact that, you know, it's impacting people in different sort of ways. The, I think that's going to be part of the way it's, we're going to be measured in the history books is how we handle the things that happen after. The fact I think we can't really help anything that's happened in the past, that's already done. Um, it's where we kind of support the people who are most at need um, as, you know, time progresses, as things get a little bit better. How we handle that is really going to be how we define the history books, I think. And so far, it's not looking good, but, you know, who knows? It could improve over the next few um, days and weeks. So let's continue here. Then we've got another one. We've got another st interesting story about Kanye's artwork supposedly put up for auction. And um, surprisingly enough, it actually looks pretty decent. He mentions, you know, without, you know, he doesn't really... St he doesn't um, hesitate to mention that he went to art college. He's an art major. He comes from a very, um, what's that word called, a studious background, um, house full of intellectuals. Um, but you don't necessarily see the art that he creates. And you always kind of, I don't know, maybe wrongly, you get the impression that Kanye is more of a Steve Jobs than he is of a, you know, of a Johnny Ive. He's probably leading and pointing the design team in the right direction, maybe inputting here and there, because obviously he has a, a really, uh, he has a good taste in that regard. He can do that. But in terms of actually drawing, drafting, sketching, conceptualizing things, you probably didn't think that was the case. But judging by the pictures of this from the auction, it looks pretty cool. So it's a headline here from The Root, which I'm pretty sure they're not really the biggest fans of Kanye with his, given his political allegiances, right? But this is, uh, here it says, Kanye West's high school artwork uh, is a praise on the Antiques Roadshow. It's headline from here, it says, um, as you, as if you didn't know, art has been in Kanye's West life for a long time, as he's been able to talk, as, uh, um, as he's been able to talk about it. The rapper producer Overall Creative was enrolled at Chicago's Hyde Park Art Academy at Asia 4 and of course dropped out of Shy Towns America Art Academy when you're studying to receive his BFA. His decision paid off clearly. On a recent episode of Antiques Roadshow, Show, the Jesus is King um, MC art portfolio was where, from when he was a student at Pol uh, Polaris High School, was featured. A pop culture memorabilia collector Laura Woolley appraised it for quite a pretty penny. The exhibitor received the art from a man claiming to be married to Yeezy's cousin, who said he had quite a collection about one year ago after Wes's mother Donna tragically passed away. Um, this is mad, isn't it? He, Kanye's got one cousin who stole, who's what sold his laptop, right? And then he's got another one who's selling the artwork that he was given by the family. I wonder if this has been approved by them, or is it something he just took and sold himself? <coughs> right, so it continues here. It says, um, I think what really attracted me to these pieces is that a lot of the people are probably not aware of how talented he is as an artist outside of music. Um, I think these pieces demonstrate an extraordinary facility as an artist, and I say to this of grouping because it shows the different mediums that he was working in. Which is you know, pretty cool, but yeah, it's 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 really impressive actually. The stuff is it's a lot better now with the student. There is school, so by 17, he's already been studying at these extraordinary artistic institutions. And my favorite part of this go to a bit at the beginning here and just view it a little bit. Received them as part of the estate about a year after she passed. So you brought in this collection of artwork that was all done by... Like this sketch is really good. It's sort of like, you wouldn't say graphite sticks, would you? The shading is really good. Very like impressive. Kanye West. You brought with you actually quite a large portfolio. We selected just a few to, to show, but yes. you, you have a great number of them. Yes. I think what really attracted me to these pieces was the fact that a lot of people are probably not aware of how talented he is as an artist outside of his music career. I think these pieces demonstrate an extraordinary facility as an artist, and I selected this grouping um, because it, it shows the different mediums he was working in. On this one we have obviously graphite. This is an unfinished piece, we have graphite again. It looks like we have gouache over there on board, and this is a technique we call scratch board. Uh, where you have color pigment laid down and then you cover it with a black ink and then it's scraped away to create an image underneath. And they're all really exceptionally well done. One of the other cool things you had in this portfolio, because you have so many drawings in there, uh, was this flyer actually advertising his first showing uh, of work. And it was done when he was 17 years old, yes. so we're talking around 1995. Correct. It also mentions that this show was done when he was uh, at the Polaris School. And a number of the pieces in your portfolio are actually identified as Polaris sophomore. Right. Mm -hmm. This flyer is really interesting because it gives the full background of his entire artistic training up until that point. Mm -hmm. And I have to say he has a very impressive resume. Right. Uh, having attended the Hyde Park Academy from age four, the Art Institute of Chicago, Chicago State University, Nanjing University, and the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. He was 
then at the Polaris School. So by age 17, he's already been studying at these extraordinary artistic institutions. And my favorite part of this uh, flyer is actually at the very end, it says that he, in the fall, will begin his studies to get a Bachelor of Fine Arts at the American Academy of Art in Chicago <laughs> and continue to pursue a career as a music producer as well. Right. That's kind of an aside. So we all know what happened, obviously, mm -hmm. music. Which is pretty cool. I recommend you check it out. It's some really cool pieces in there. And again, um, it's, it, I, I'm assuming a lot of this wasn't stuff that he probably wanted to put out there. I think he's been a bit private with... Oh, you know, he's actually sending interviews. He's quiet. He's a more of a show and tell sort of dude. He doesn't really want to put out stuff he's doing or stuff in progress. So it's a very rare insight into some of the artwork that he's done. But I recommend you check it out. There's a lot of really good stuff there. What did, what did it end up fetching for him price, actually? Did I mention it here? It says here, yeah, the pieces included um, an original sketch pad, da 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 um, a flyer that accompanies his pieces listed the prices ranging from $12 to 30 Now, given his superstar status, they could potentially sell for anywhere between sixteen and 23000 So, again, I think there's a lot of people that collect all the kind of album, original album cover posters and memory merch and all that sort of stuff. But I think if you're a big Kanye fan, this is definitely um, far more interesting to put in your collection than, you know, some merch that you got from the Yeezus tour. This definitely shows kind of, there, there is probably a lot more of what he's doing currently in the work that he's got there than the stuff that he was doing with his albums, I would say. Because this shows, this definitely shows that, you know, the goal engine, it's sort of like a backwards way of doing it. Because usually you would maybe, usually in order to kind of broaden your musical repertoire or range or appeal, you would get into arts once your kind of, your career sort of like tailed off. But he essentially got into contemporary art then decided he went to do music in order to kind of broaden the ability to do more in the art world, which he's kind of kind of done with the installations that he do with the Sunday service and, you know, the way he thinks about things, conceptualizes albums and all that sort of funny approaches. So he did it kind of the the other way around, sort of like a upside down, downside in sort of way, which is kind of, you know, it does kind of sum up him as a person in general. But I definitely recommend you check it out. Um, some really good, interesting pieces there from the one we call Yay. Let's move on. What else we have here to talk about? Da, 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 da. Oh, um, Carlos Mencia decided to go on the Valuetainment um, channel and sort of explain himself. If you're not familiar with Carlos Mencia, he was f made famous actually, even before he's, you know, he's got a really, before this whole kicked off, he had pretty good, he was pretty well regarded in the industry. He was sort of like the main person people were looking at in the comedy or stand up world. And then it was kind of a. Um, then news got out that he was stealing jokes from fellow comedians, which is a big faux pas in the stand-up comedy world. You should never steal jokes. Then he did that thing that people get annoyed about a lot in the comedy world where he's bumping people, which meant if you were meant to go up at, let's say, if you were meant to go up at like nine, which is maybe a prime spot, let's say like eight, and he came in early or he came in later, he'd he essentially have seniority over you and he could essentially jump in front of you. And then what usually happens if he jumps in front of you and he's a well-known act, he would usually do a lot longer of a set than you would do as a kind of up-and-coming person, which would then lead you to have to come on later, um, which might mean the crowd might thin out, people might leave after the main guy has performed, which is it's just not really looked at as a good thing. So he'd do that a lot, a lot of seeing jokes, a lot of bumping. And then eventually he did it to the wrong group of people. He ended up doing it to one of Joe, to some of Joe Rogan's friends. If you know anything about Joe Rogan, he's sort of like the matriarch of the LA comedy scene. He got involved and he famously kind of ripped Cosman a new one on stage and kind of exposed him to everybody out there. And, and that essentially ruined his reputation. Not not in inter, not in not post it because I think um, in the moment the comedy store and the industry sort of took the side of Joe, Joe Rogan and he kind of got thrown out of the comedy store. But then as the years progressed, um, people started to see through the lies and then essentially um, Carlos Messier got cancelled before it was even cancelling was even a thing. And he's sort of been in um, uh, comedy isolation since then, right? No one's kind of touched him with a barge pole. And I think, unlike other industries, comedy is really good that way in that usually, if even if somebody, I think I've kind of, I've ascribed it this way, I think, if you've seen somebody online, if you've seen a comedian online that you don't necessarily like, but you see them hanging around all the comedians that you do like, it's really a good indicator of that person's character outside of what you see on the screen, usually. Because for the most part, I've seen if somebody's a bit of a shithead and people don't like them, they just don't hang around the people that you like. They just aren't around there anymore. Um, they do value a lot of... They do put in... They, they put on a high pedestal, maybe similar to skateboarding that way, where... Um, 
people care more about what people in the industry, people, their, their peers think about them as opposed to just random strangers. Um, so that kind of allows them to kind of police themselves. So uh, that was basically what happened. And since then, you know, he's obviously still working as a comedian. He's not working a normal office job. So that is still a good thing. But in terms of being welcomed by his community, by his peers, no one really wants to touch him. So um, credit to Value Tainment for sitting him down and having an interview with him and sort of allowing him to kind of explain himself. But as you see with this clip I'm going to play, he doesn't necessarily apologize. He sort of kind of half kind of says you know, I tried my best to apologize. No, he, he basically, how he explains it is that he has nothing to apologize for because he doesn't think he did the things that people are angry about him for. And I guess when you want to, when you want to, when you want to apologize or you want to kind of rectify things, one thing that you quickly realize is that it's very unlikely that two people are going to agree on every, you're going to agree on every point of contrition. You're not going to do that. There has to be a time where you sort of like agree to disagree, but for the sake of, um, for the sake of uh kinship for the sake of maintaining the peace you just kind of you know okay cool i submit i apologize for that i don't mean to i didn't mean to hurt your feelings but you don't say oh if you were offended i'm sorry you just apologize outright so you can move on and um you know continue your friendship but he didn't want to do that so this is a clip from Viatema that sort of uh, lays it bare a bit so you can hear or see what i'm talking about My dad told me this a long time ago when we came here. So let me tell you how America's built. He said America likes new heroes. I agree. But when they get new heroes, America loves to see that new hero fall. Right. But what America loves even more is to see that fallen hero redeem himself and come back up. Completely and he gets agree. Bigger. I think you have a big opportunity to do that, man. I I I, I agree, but here's the problem. You want me to, or people want me to accept something that I I didn't do in the way that they say that I did. I don't know. I... Which is the issue. So in his head, he just doesn't think he stole any jokes the way they think he did it. So he probably is kind of describing himself. Maybe he's kind of his excuses that is parallel thinking. I don't know. But I'll just think with all these years that have gone by, I think it's maybe 15 years since that incident happened. There has to come a point. There has to come. There has to come to a point where, if everyone agrees with the narrative that you are a joke thief, then you just have to, you know, confess and just say, look, even though I don't agree with what you're saying, just for the sake of just, con you know, so I can go back, welcome, welcome back into community scene, I'm gonna say sorry, but he just doesn't want to say it, which is bizarre, really, because I think. You know, again, looking from the outside in, it looks like if you're not friends with other stand-ups, you're essentially just, you know, what, what are you then? Are you really a stand-up comedian if you can't go on people's podcasts, if you can't hang out, if you can't exchange jokes on social media? It doesn't necessarily seem as fun, is it? Part of the reason why you're doing this is to kind of be a, um, to kind of be an adult kid. And what's the point of just doing it as just a job when you don't have the that camaraderie with your fellow peers? That doesn't make any sense, but I don't know. And I'm smart enough to know that I, I could apologize and move on and whatever. But like I said, I've I've called these guys personally. I've asked them about it. It it doesn't come up other than in moments like this. I I don't know what to say to you. Which I don't think is true. He said it doesn't come up in moments like this. But I'm pretty sure these guys. If there's anything I know about listening to comedians on podcasts, is that they're a chatty bunch. They love a good gossip. So. He might not think it comes up in the conversations because he's not there, but it definitely does come up. Maybe one day you you should ask, you know, Joe, if you have him on, why, why he did it, what his impetus was. You know, I, I don't know. Maybe When's one day... the last day... time you reached out to him? Okay, so from my perspective, yeah. here's a guy who, who purposely tried to ruin my career and in many ways succeeded. I've never done anything to him. Which is a weird sort of way of explaining the situation because it takes out all the context and all the nuance that led to it. In his head, he doesn't think he has any reason to call Joe Rogan, even though he says he ascribes the fact that his guy ruined his career. But if you look at it, he ruined your own career. If you allow these, because I think if you're not a joke thief and you're not somebody that essentially screws over other comedians because that's what it looks like it looks like for the most part they try and protect their own right that's why sometimes a lot of people some comedians get really pissed off when you know 
other comedians pile on to the pylon, right? When there's like a cancel thing going on, Irish Effie, whoever it may be, or Lucy K. Other comedians don't like it when other comedians start kicking them the way they're down because they know they're acutely aware that it could that kind of um cancelling could come back around and bite you in the ass and then you who who are you gonna be your friends at that point? So if you're someone like Carlos Mencia, you have to come to a realization that even though you don't think you did anything wrong, people think you did something wrong. So you urge yourself to try and clarify, to try and rectify the situation by addressing it head on, calling the person that called you out and seeing if you can kind of smooth it over. And if you can't, fair enough, you've tried. But at least try to do that. And he hasn't because I think he doesn't want to hear the answers. He doesn't want to be confronted with the truth. He's trying to bury his head in the sand. But again, I don't know why he'd want to do that for 15 years. I have nothing to apologize to him for. He's one person that I never bumped. I never went on before him when he was on schedule. Always on after him. I don't have any reason to call him. If I did, I would. It would. Which is weird. So he doesn't have to call him because Joe Rogan, he didn't bump him directly. But what he did do to him was that he, he affected um, his friends, right? He kind of brought harm to Joe Rogan's friends so if, you're, if your friend is I would imagine I don't know everyone is different in their regard but I'd imagine if somebody did wrong by your friend you will try and back them up right in any way that you can so it's not out of the realms that if your friends didn't want to speak up with it especially back then right back then maybe the entertainment world was a bit more of a gay institution there were more gatekeepers there were more poops that you had to jump through you had to kind of acquiesce to some people you had to kind of play the you know the doting wannabe entertainer um, you had to take more shit so maybe they didn't want to say anything because they want to ruin their chances of getting books on a show booking a commercial getting a feature going on the road uh booking a commercial whatever they didn't want to hamper their chances of earning a living in the thing that they love so they just kept it quiet but somebody like rogan who was a bit you know who had maybe a few money at the time who was untethered who didn't have any um corporate sponsors telling him what he couldn't and couldn't do he felt that it was his duty to come in and sort of call it out and that's what he did just call it out on the behalf of his friends if you watch the original video that's what he basically does he doesn't say it happened to him he says it happened to all his friends seemed disingenuous it from my opinion because so, what, what, what what would i say so i i say you hired me at, and it's called the david pr firm right i'm your publicist right and i'm your attorney yeah so i'm a guy that got my jd Tell me and something better than the hundreds of thousands of dollars I've spent on guys telling me to do that. Now watch this. We're sitting out. Actually, yeah. and, and I'm doing a pro bono. I don't even want your money, okay? <laughs> okay. We're friends. Okay. We went to, you got a four-year degree. We went to college together. Right. And we partied together. Right. And we always got along, right. right? We went to clubs. We had a blast. We have great stories. We have right. bad stories on your end. Right. You've seen me hammer plastered. You have to right. pick me up and put me in the car. Okay. So we're talking. All That's right. who we are, right? Yeah. I say, do you know what, Carlos? You say what? I said, dude. How confident are you that you didn't do any of this stuff? Pat, I'm telling you, I'm 100% confident. Nothing. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm 100% confident. Bro, if you're that confident, I think you should send out a tweet and say, if Joe is willing to have me on his show and we go live and he wants to bring any other friends that he wants to say that this happened, I'm willing to go on. I've done that. Through proxies. Not proxies. Public. Oh, I've done that with friends of his that I have befriended. But that's not how to do it, though. Mm. If you are that confident in what you're doing, because if you go on Twitter right now mm -hmm. and you say, Joe, it's been 15 years. Mm -hmm. I want to know why you were so mad at me. Right. I'm willing to come ask me any question you want. I, I have no problem doing that. Have you done that? No. I'd love to see you do it. But I've done it, like I said. Through proxies, but 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 this is I've a big difference. I've done it through through friends of you know friends of his uh, that uh, I befriended and said, "Hey." Which again, this is this is kind of the crux of it. And again, it continues on and on. He just doesn't, you know, he, he finally gets that towards the end. But I think from conclusion, it looks like he doesn't necessarily want to have that conversation because he's afraid of what may come up. Because I'm sure there's probably more to this story than what is kind of been said in public probably more stuff that will probably make him look worse so the best way to do it is to kind of play the innocent naive i don't know what's going on these guys are crazy i didn't do anything wrong sort of routine but again i just would i would just it's just bizarre to me because i would assume being left out in a cold this long in a community that you were you know 
one of the mainstays of who you were, you know, he, he was very popular at the time, well known. He was one that had all the heat behind him. Suddenly go from there to suddenly now playing on cruises or in random places that no one gives a shit about to not having us because you know, this is Carlos Mancia, mate. He's a you know, he's a legend in the game, not even quote unquote. He's he's got a really good CV in terms of in comedy, but he doesn't have a special on Netflix, doesn't have one on Amazon or YouTube, nothing. He's just kind of doing his thing in India on his own. And that's because he's essentially been iced out by the industry. No one wants to touch him with a barge pole. So you'd assume in his position, he'd want to clarify the situation so he could get back in the good grace of everybody and just be safe. But he doesn't want to. So I'm assuming it's because he doesn't want to unearth the skeletons that happened pre previously. And to be honest as well, I just don't think Rogan would have him run anyway. I think he's... Um, I wouldn't say he's... Uh, he does Rogan surprises you sometimes because he did have Stephen Crowder on and that went really bad the first time and he had him on the second time again or he apologized I don't know but he, he does do things that you don't expect but I think things like this when they're so egregious when they're so blatant when the person doesn't make any sign of effort to rectify the situation he, there's no way that you can kind of speak sense to him but I'm interested to see what's going to happen now because he does have an interview booked in for the Tiger Belly podcast so that might be a good way to kind of uh, get back in the groups of people but I don't know I'm not too sure I don't think it's going to be a good thing for him to go on those shows and blame himself bear it's going to probably end up in more tears but who knows anyway that's an hour of the show thanks so much for tuning in as per usual uh, um, if it's your first time don't make it your last time um, smash that like hit subscribe leave me a comment down below pushing via the YouTube if you're listening via the podcast of course a five star review help to get the show out there and let people know what's going on and again i'll see you guys again tomorrow but if you want to see more stuff regarding myself mixes all that sort of stuff blog which i'm updating every day then check out my link below it's called agassinozinger.com check out all my links there all my links are associated linked on there blog mix page all that stuff and i'll see you guys again tomorrow for the episode of the show until then take care be safe <laughs>